So welcome today to Proverbs Through the Eyes of the Living Letters. And today we're, we've gone through the first nine chapters of Proverbs, and there's been a lot of foundation laid over the last several months that we've been going through each one of these each one of these chapters. And as I told you, when as we got closer to where it began to go over what's considered as the Proverbs of Solomon, then uh, those were the ones where we're going to we're going to take our time going through, and we're going to talk about every one. And uh, moving into Proverbs ten, this is the beginning of those statements. And, and I love it because as we go through each one, I'll kind of explain what's going on during each one of these, these sets of Proverbs. Because in some cases, there are a, a group of Proverbs that are stated, and they do seem somewhat unrelated. But they're just uh, statements. But they, they usually keep a theme nonetheless. So this first uh, set that we're going to be going through, uh, Proverbs 10 verses 1 through 10, is, is really looking at the place between a, it's really looking at it from a spiritual sense, the difference between the righteous and the wicked, and the responses of both. And the idea behind this is it gives us an opportunity to be able to see, you know, and and if you will, to judge ourselves. The truth is, is that judgment really begins right here. And, And in my opinion, it's very rare that I would judge outside of it. There are times that I need to, and and Holy Spirit allows me to know when those times are. And there's times that you know that. There's a time when you when you come near a situation, or if you're at a place and you don't feel right, there's a judgment that then in a sense takes place because you walk away from it. You say, okay, I don't, I want nothing to do with this. Or there's something inside of your spirit, man, that even if it seems good, you're like, no, hold on. So it's a choice, but choice is a judgment. It's saying, I don't, I choose not to do that particular thing. And uh, and, and to be honest with you, that's the vast majority of the, the judgment that needs to take place. I, I really have been messed with about the scripture that says, if you judge yourself, you will not be judged. So the scriptures, if you judge yourself, you will not be judged. And he's talking about that place that really the first place that we need to, to change if we want to repair the world, if we want to fix the world, the first thing that we need to fix is here. This is the first place we need to fix. And from that place, then, then as we have changed our perspective, as we have changed on the inside of us, as we have moved from a place of fear to love, because truth be told, in the spirit realm, there's only two things, fear and love. Now, I know some of you may say, no, 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 wait, wait, that's fear and faith. No, well, actually, faith is the is the transition between fear and love, because the ultimate is the love of the Father and His goodness. He's 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 a good, good God, and He loves us, and everything that He does is good. And so, faith takes us from that place of of operating in the in a, in a realm of fear, and it transitions us into that place of love. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, the substance of his love and the evidence of his love in our lives. Are you getting that? You see what I'm talking about here? So faith transitions between the two, but there are only really two things, fear and love. And so in that place when that we're talking about here, that's kind of what we're seeing as we look through Proverbs 10 verses 1 through 10, because we're looking at the different aspects between the, the righteous and the wicked. And I, I love this because uh, Solomon begins to open up even more of what he's been talking about in the previous nine chapters. So let's get going because I want to d- dive right down into it because they these 10 do seem to be unrelated and they seem to be Excuse me, they don't, they don't seem to be. They are. They're called comparison proverbs, if you will. They're, they're a place where you've got the comparison. Some of the other proverbs aren't quite like that. And some of them are will have two statements that are towards the same side. And we'll see that in verse 10 here in just a little bit. Verse 10 is a little bit different than the first nine because it it actually state, it states something that's that's the same in both in both sides of it. But again, it's the place of helping us to understand to where we can judge in ourselves. Where do we sit in the middle of something? So Proverbs 10, I'm, I'm actually going to read it through in the Michelet this time. 
and uh and then and hear all of that like we've been doing i've been i've been reading in the uh the passion translation and then going over and using the michelet to go through it well holy spirit had me do something a little bit different this time so i'm going to read the entirety of proverbs 1 through 10 through the michelet and then we're actually going to go through the uh passion translation and the proverbs that way i believed i just saw that there was there was a better expression by using the the passion translation and it was a little bit easier to understand as as we were walking through that so in Proverbs 10, verses 1 through 10 in the Michelet, it says this, the Proverbs of Solomon, a wise son gladdens a father, but a foolish son is his mother's sorrow. Treasures of wickedness will not avail, but charity rescues from death. Hashem, Adonai, Yahweh, will not bring hunger upon the soul of a righteous one, but the destructiveness of the wicked shall batter them. A deceitful scale makes a pauper, but the hand of the diligent brings prosperity. A wise son gleans in the summer, but a shameful son slumbers through the harvest. Blessings will descend upon the head of a righteous one, but their violence will smother the mouth of the wicked. Now that's an interesting one, and I can't wait till we get to that one because uh, it doesn't it doesn't uh, it, it doesn't speak the way it sounds right there. Remembrance of a righteous one brings blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. The wise heart will seize good deeds, but one of foolish lips will become weary. He who walks in perfect innocence will walk securely, but he who perverts his ways will be broken. He who winks an eye causes sadness, but one of foolish lips will be considered perverted. All right, and that's Proverbs 10 verses 1 through 10 there. So let me, in the Passion Translation, it says this. The, uh, again, verse one starts off with the wisdom of Solomon. When wisdom comes to a son, joy comes to a father. When a son turns from wisdom, a mother grieves. Now, this particular proverb begins to talk about the place of really discipline and nurture. You remember, discipline is the Hebrew word musar. And it speaks of uh, that place of of really wise discipline. There's there's discipline, and then there's wise dis- discipline. In Hebrew, that's musar haskel, and the the words begin to open up the place of of disciplining a child as they grow, so that they as they grow older, they're able to know and to understand. In other words, teaching a child about things that they're going to be dealing with, and teaching a child about. You know things like finances. I mean, I'll be honest with you. My 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 dad was a uh, my dad was actually in the in the navy for twenty something years, and uh, he worked in several different positions. But one of his later positions before he he actually retired was as a um, um, comptroller for the Eastern Seaboard of the U.S. Navy. Comptroller is basically kind of like an accountant, if you will. Uh, and one of the things that he had done was 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 went in and found some mistakes that they had actually had in some of their things and it and had saved the Navy a lot of money with with as, as a result of that. But one of the things he didn't do with me <laughs> was teach me about finances. And uh, and 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 I don't don't get me wrong. I'm not I'm not talking bad about my father. I love my father greatly. And and a matter of fact, he he died at a very early age. He he was 52 when he passed away. I'm older than he is now than, than when he passed away. And uh and and of course that 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 hurts because I I I really would love to have him here and now to see what father has done and and for me to be able to see what father is is doing in him. But there's there's a lot to all of that story. I don't even I wasn't even planning on bringing up my father. But one of the things that my father did do, even though he didn't teach me about about finances, what he did teach me about was that place of the fear of the Lord in many different ways. My father was a a strong disciplinarian. And for many years, I was like, man, (laughs) you're just mean, dad. You know, why are you being so mean? And as a, and as a kid, that's, that's all you think about is like, you know, you're stopping me from doing the things that I want to do. But as a young child, we don't understand the full the full ramifications of what happens on the other side of that. And, and, and my dad was really good about, about disciplining. And, and so when a, when a son becomes wise, 
it brings joy to the father because most of what the father does now i'm not saying not all and there's there we're in a world now where this is is wide and varied and i promise you i am not trying to be um I'm not trying to be anything in the sense where I recognize the fact that sometimes there are single parents, single mothers, as well as single fathers. And sometimes they have to play both parts. And to those, I bless you. I, and Father, I ask your, your supernatural blessings upon those that are that their heart is for their children and they're and they're raising them up and having to play two, two separate roles. So again, I'm just going by what the Proverbs itself here says. And it says that it talks about the place where the father usually brings about the place of discipline. It's the one, he's the one who, who makes sure that things stay on the straight and narrow, if you will. The mother, on the other hand, is is more on that nurture side of that. So taking care of the daily things, if you will, they're the ones that 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 they see the child from day to day. Because many times the father is at work. In yeah, again, I'm I'm using a generality here, uh, but uh, in in this place, then the mother begins to see the child, and there's a there's a different level. Now, guess a mother disciplines. Don't get me wrong. Mother will always discipline their their child, but. Their their heart is also the nurturing aspect of of the of the family and and making sure that child knows how to love knows how to give knows how to care and those sort of things and so this this proverb begins to talk about um, the place of the when a, when a son becomes wise it makes the father proud because he you know he recognizes that his discipline has done something with the child but when a son turns from wisdom. In some cases, the the according to the Michelet, it kind of gives this this thought of of the father says, "Well, he didn't turn out wise," but to a mother, it breaks her heart because she 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 has been with them on the day to day, and and it grieves the mother to see the son not be able to take the discipline that the father has given. And 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 some children have a choice. Oh, not some children have a choice, right? Children do have a choice to a certain extent, to a certain extent. And what I mean by that is that a, a parent can impose discipline and the child will undergo that discipline, but yet rebel against the discipline and and choose not to, to use that discipline in order to be able to learn and to grow. And, and that's talking about the rebellious child is what I'm talking about there. So this first begins to talk about this place of this, but we can also see this from a metaphoric sense, because in, a, in the metaphoric sense, this also is talking about Yahweh. It's talking about Adonai, and he is the father. And so in that place where he sees us looking to him, looking at him and wanting to become like him and become what we behold, he begins to see that place. And so of, of, of our hearts wanting to be wise, and we take the wisdom and we do something with it. See, that's the key. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding are a key part of everything. And it's it's knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, and the ways that both of them work that bring about a place of, if you will, that discipline, the Musar, the Musar Eskel, the wise discipline of our father. Does not the scripture say that he chastises those he loves? Right? So we're going to get into that a little bit more. There's some some more of this that I want to hold off to some of these other proverbs because it it brings up some some different aspects of of even what this is talking about here. So verse two says this: gaining wealth through dishonesty is no gain at all, but honesty brings you lasting happiness. So you know when we start talking about gaining wealth, there there's a place where if you will, it's a choice. So I was actually going to wait and use this parable in another in another one of the Proverbs. And I'll bring it back up in that proverb as well. But I find that it's it's I can't help but but bring it up here at, at this particular one as well. And there was a proverb that uh, uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai had had spoken about, and it's a very simple proverb because the proverb basically is about two sons, and both of them receive an inheritance. All right, in in the one of the sons, 
what they did was he he decided that he would waste a penny a day or he would he would go and take a penny a day and do something with it that he wanted to do spending it on frivolous things i know this has a an air of the uh of the prodigal son uh but this is a little bit different than the prodigal son story because one of them just fritters away a penny a day and and the other son takes a penny a day and puts it into savings so with the completion of all of this one of the sons becomes poor and one of the sons becomes wealthy. Why? Because he took and he saw both of them had the opportunity to choose to do something with what they had received. But one of them took a portion of that and put it aside and saved it. And at the completion of that, he still had money left over and it began to grow and grow exponentially because he chose to, to be wise with what he had and did something with it. And that's exactly what this is talking about. It's saying that gaining wealth through dishonesty is no gain at all. So in other words, if, if I choose to, uh, uh, there's another parable that, that, that kind of doesn't make a little, doesn't make sense to me completely, except that, that as I, as I describe one part of this, so I've got, you've got a farmer and he's trying to sell his, his wheat to a, a buyer, but in order to, to make sure that everything is taken care of, he he instead of of receiving funds from every time he actually sells the uh, the, the 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 wheat to the the buyer instead of taking and uh, uh receiving the money right away he takes a penny and he puts it into a sack and at the end of the year they come back and they 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 rectify all that all those pennies in the sack based on the set amount that they had chosen to to purchase it for and then the farmer would receive the money from the buyer in one lump sum as opposed to uh you know receiving it every time he delivers and and so the the farmer decides that that he, he instead of he, he's got a big huge sack of of these pennies he, and he reaches his hands in and he pulls out of the pennies now all he got was a handful of pennies and he actually rejoiced in the fact that he had he had actually just uh, uh received all of these pennies because in a in a sense what he did was he dipped in to the the pile before the buying took place before the actual selling took place. And so what could have been a tremendous amount of wealth, because each penny didn't represent a single penny, it represented more than that. He took that little bit that he was able to grab with his hand and rejoiced over just that little bit. And, and it became really a, a dishonest because he was really being dishonest to himself and not necessarily to the buyer in this case. Because he took the little pittance and 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 uh, and and wasted it away as opposed to as opposed to doing it. so that starts to make sense. So so even though this dishonesty doesn't have to be necessarily with someone else, sometimes we can be just as dishonest with ourselves as we can with other people as well. And gaining wealth through this dishonesty is really no gain at all. He could have had a much higher reward, but honesty brings you lasting happiness. It brings you that place of of knowing that 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 Father has taken um, taken care of everything, and and it's funny because when we when we look at it in this sense, when we look at it this sense, especially this first part of it, gaining wealth through dishonesty is no gain at all. Um, really comes back to that place of the fact that that the cost of wickedness really was only imposed by the one who was being wicked. In this case, it was the farmer. And his cost was imposed by himself because he was the one that grabbed his hands in there. But through the place of, of, of honesty, see, it didn't do anything for the buyer. Matter of fact, it reduced the amount that the buyer was going to have to give to the farmer. You see that, right? It reduced the amount. I don't know why the farmer would get the, the, the great idea. I guess he guess he thought because of pulling up that it, it took care of an immediate need, but it was dishonest. It was a dishonest gain because he had already set up with the buyer to for those pennies to be used for a higher amount of money. Well, how many times have we have, have each of us? And one of the things my parents taught me early on was that place about stealing and, and so on. And that's what this is talking about. 
But don't forget that stealing isn't necessarily just from someone else. We can steal from ourselves as well. And Father is, is, is teaching us. See, wisdom brings about that place of recognizing, wait a minute, I'm not going to take this small amount and, and, and use it for, for an immediate need. Father, unless you're calling to me, and if that's the case, then I know you're going to take care of all of my needs. But Father, I don't want to take it just to flitter it away. But Father, that, that you're teaching me that place of wisdom in the way that I handle my money. And that's what this one's talking about. Let's continue on. Verse three says this, the Lord satisfies the longings of all his lovers, but he withholds from the wicked's what this, what their souls crave. I love this because in, in verse three in the Michelet, it says it a little bit differently, and I'm going to read it here. Um, it says uh, in, in verse three in the Michelet, Hashem will not bring hunger upon the soul of a righteous one, but the destructiveness of the wicked shall batter them. And, and, and you can see a, a very difference between the way that these are, are talked about between the way that Dr. Brian Simmons had written this in, in uh, the Passion, as opposed to the, the, the literal translation with regards to, um, with, with regards to the Michelet. Both of them bring about a beautiful aspect of this, because, you know, one that I love, like, let me, let me just use my, my wife as an example, my daughter as an example. You know, I love my wife and my daughter with with all my heart, and and in that place of the love that I have for them, then then they know that that, that even still, my daughter's thirty four years old, and it's 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 gotten fewer and farther between. So that's that's a good thing. But um, if she ever needs anything, if she ever has a place where she's in need and and needs some help she always knows that she can come to me and, and ask and and whether i can do it or not she she it's 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 she still loves me for it nonetheless because there's been times that i've had to say no uh but th there's been other times when of course i would say absolutely and i would take care of that because i i want to i want to see the best for her. i want to see her grow up to be if you will that wise daughter you know that that we talked about in verse one and, and the same, if it's true for me, how much more so could that be true with Father? Period. Plain and simple. If me, as a father, knows how to good gives, give good gifts to my children, how much more so will my Father in heaven give good gifts to those who love him? Who's, to those who have, have focused their heart, to those that that... It's not about what you can do for me, God. It's about the fact that I love you. And, 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 and even, if you, if, even if nothing happens, it's irrelevant. I still love you, Father, with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And, and, and I will stand in that place of my love for you no matter what. And so the Lord satisfies the longings of all his lovers. He takes care of it. I like this because of the Mishle, it talks about, will not bring hunger upon the soul of the righteous one. So we talk about the place of, of, of needing things. And it's funny because one of the things that the father has been walking me through over the past week, and, and I find it so interesting that even before we get into some of these, and, and, I've, and I've had the opportunity to be able to study and prepare for, for what we're going to be talking about, the Lord will many times walk me through the, the very heart of exactly what we're going to be talking about in the Mishle and in the Proverbs that we're talking about here. And this is a perfect example of one. Because uh, one of the things that the Lord's been talking to me over the last several weeks has been about that place of my daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, how long has it been since I, and I'm speaking to myself here, how long has it been since I have really thought about that Lord's prayer? It's been a, it's been a minute. It's been a while. And, and I hate that because there's, there's a part of that that I've kind of diminished into it being almost a religious thing. But it's not. And, and I only have myself to blame for that aspect of looking at it from that religious sense. Because the truth is, is this was a heart cry of the Father. And, and through Yeshua, and, and, and he was telling us and teaching us what the Father is saying to us. And so give us this day our daily bread is what he's been talking about. And so in the mornings when I've been waking up, I've been saying, Father, I thank you for my daily bread for today. Not only 
first and foremost for the revelation of that which you have for me today, the bread, the manna, that that you've given me for, for, for understanding, to, to be able to take your words and to become wise with those words. Because I don't want to be just one who learns wisdom to learns wisdom. That isn't wisdom. That's knowledge. If I want to learn it to learn it, it's knowledge. It's not wisdom. Because wisdom applies it. Not only that, but remember, wisdom is a chad. Wisdom is one. Wisdom is father. It is only in understanding when there's a when there's a division of wisdom. And that's only because there's a place that I can understand because of the, the facet who, of who Father has made me to be. And in that place of, of him giving me that understanding, it helps me in my walk as I as I as I as I run towards him, as I as I see the the depth of of my love for him and I and I cry out for him and oh you get the heart of what I'm trying to say. And uh uh so in that place, then uh the Lord takes care of, of, of everything that I need for that day in revelation and in finances and in anything else that I may need for that day. Give us this day our daily bread, those things that are needed for today. Tomorrow will take care of itself. You remember the, the script, the scripture in the the in the I believe it's Corinthians, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, one of those. It's in the epistles there. And it talks about the place of, you know, um, who can how can you add even one more day to your life or one measure of your stature with uh uh by worrying? You can't, it's not possible. He said, look at the trees, look at the flowers, look how they're taking, look at the birds of the air. Thank you, and Andy. Uh in Matthew, he says, uh, how you know, and that's right, that is it is in Matthew, so it's in the in the gospels. Um, how can you add one day to your life or anything? So uh I thank you, Father, for the place of that daily bread and what you've given us for, for every single day. Now, there's a deeper part of that. I don't have time to get into right now. There's a deeper part of that because, and I do want to kind of allude to it just a little bit in, in the sense of, of Father has given us his daily bread for today. And so in this place, can I then through wisdom take and do just like that second son did and save a portion of that? If you will, save 10% of that and put it aside for that place where it, it can be, a, can it, it has the opportunity to be allowed to grow. I think there was, there's wisdom in that. Some cases, the father may say, I want you to give all. And in other cases, he may say, uh, I, I've, I've given you an opportunity. I want you to, to do something with this. Take and save a portion of this behind for yourself. I know that there's a there's a place in the uh, uh, Old Testament in uh, Numbers, and it talks specifically about the tithe, but not necessarily in the tithe that goes to the church. What it's talking about is the tithe to yourself. And Father instructs the people of Israel during this time to take 10% and set it aside. Let's talk about the 10%, and that 10% is for themselves. And, and he says, now I want you to set it aside and I want you to, to allow that to grow until the time where I take you into the land flowing with milk and honey, because in that place, then you can use it for whatever your heart desires. That's exactly what the scripture says. You can do with it whatever you want to with it. You can use it to invest. You can use it for, for whatever is, is, is something that's in your heart. This is set aside for you to do something with. So again, we're talking about wisdom and that place of wisdom. And yeah, absolutely, Andy, no limits. But the but he who withholds from the wicked, but he withholds from the wicked, this is talking about the Lord, but he withholds from the wicked what their souls crave. Now that reminds me of uh of Gomer in uh, Hosea, Hosea's wife, because that's exactly what he did with uh, Gomer. He told he told the he told her, I'm gonna wrap a hedge of thorns around you and I'm gonna send you out into the desert. And and you're going to try to go after your lovers because you thought in them that you got your wine, your oil and your drink and all the things that you needed. And he said the whole time it was coming from me, never from them. And so when you try to go after them, you're not going to be able to reach them. You're not going to be able to connect and they're not going to be able to give or do anything for you. 
And it's going to come to the place where you begin to realize that I, the Lord says, I, the Lord says that I'm the one that gave you the wine. I'm the one that gave you the oil. I'm the one that gave you all your jewels and the, the fine things that you needed. And, and he says, you will come back to me because you'll see, you'll see, and you will say that it was better with my first love. It's better with you, father, than it was with my, with the, the, the idols and those things that I ran after. Slackers, verse four says this, slackers will know what it means to be poor while the hard worker becomes wealthy. Now, I think we can take that one at pretty much face value and uh, and 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 begin to, to, to see what it's talking about because it goes without saying, does it not? Slackers will know what it means to be poor because if you slack off and you don't do anything about something, then poverty will be what's going to come as a result of that slacking off and not doing something. Now, what can slacking off mean? Does it have to do with just about on the work side of things? No, sometimes the slacking off can be in the place of, of the way that we see things. I have two questions in our class that we, we talk about all the time. And those two questions have been pivotal for me. And they were, what do you see and how do you see it? And so uh, the Lord may present something to me and if I look at it and I choose to see it as little or nothing, then for me, that is all it will ever be, is little or nothing. When hidden inside what seems to be a, a rough exterior, what seems to be a difficulty, what seems to be a challenge, is hidden a treasure that's beyond compare. But it, again, what did I see and how do I see it? Well, this is where wisdom comes into play. This is where the, the father is teaching us his wisdom so that we can look at that and say, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I know that sometimes the most the, the largest treasures, treasures of revelation, treasures, treasures in finances, treasures in, in many different things are hidden inside of a package that doesn't seem to be very big at all. I remember when I was a kid, uh, one of the things I wanted was a gold bracelet. Uh, well, I can't not like a herringbone gold bracelet and uh, or not the herringbone. It was the link, the big, fat, thick link uh, uh, bracelets. And um, I was expecting something a little bit different, but the package. So, you know, normally a bracelet would come in a package that's that's usually um, a bit of a rectangle and, and, and longer than it is wide. Uh, but the way that it showed up was a very small package. <laughs> very small package and it didn't fit the picture of what I had thought it was. And, and I, and I, and I, I got a little disappointed even before I even opened up the gift. And I heard my father say small, good things come in small packages. And, and so when I opened it up and I was able to see, I realized that they had hidden it inside that. And they were really trying to teach me something in that place. So sometimes the way things look doesn't always mean that it's bad. And that's what this is talking about here. Slackers will know what it means to be poor, and the hard, while the hard worker becomes wealthy, it's funny. I'm reminded of a story, another story, real quick that that I, th I think is is key. Uh, this story has has to do with a son and a and a father, and uh, this father was very wealthy, and 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 he had done everything he could to teach his son um, the business and and. Uh, you know, good good finances. It taught him how to how to uh, how to take care of himself as 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 he became a man. And but there was one thing that the young man had told his father since he was twelve years old that he wanted for his graduation. And and he said he says I want a Porsche. Okay, whatever you want to put input, whatever you would like to put in there. I'm just using a Porsche because a. Uh, to a to a twelve year old, a Porsche would be like a big, nice sports car, and something that would be be uh, just just something absolutely awesome to receive. And uh, uh, anyway, he he so he begins to tell his father that, and every year the father asks him, "What do you want for graduation?" And every year he told him the same thing: "I want a Porsche. I want a Porsche." Well, in the meantime, it came close to his his time for his graduation. And they were having a large graduation party, and the father came up, comes up to him, and and he takes and he brings him a gift, but it's unwrapped, 
And it's a book. And this book was talking about the place of wisdom and the heart of wisdom and what the father had been teaching him throughout his, his young age, but realizing that there was still going to be a place of growth for the young man as he, as he moved and as he, as he grew older, got married and, and, had, uh, and had children. And so the, the father says, says, here, son, this is, this is the gift that I have for you for your graduation. And the, the, the son looks at it and, and says, but dad, from the time I was 12 years old, you have said that, that I have said to you that I wanted a, a, a Porsche. And, and, and I, I just, I, I was convinced that that's what you were going to give me. And all you're giving me is this book. And he takes the book and he throws it away, throws it in the, in the house, in his house. He throws it away because his father had come to his house to give it to him and leaves it alone. As time progressed, his father grew older and the father passed away. And uh, when the young man, who was a little bit older now, 10, 15 years older, young man remembered that book. And even though he had been mad about it, even though he had thrown the book, he took the book and he stuffed it up on a shelf and left it there. And he went back and he remembered that book again. And he went back to the book. And he began to look because he was reminded of his father and the wisdom that his father taught him. And he flipped to the back of the uh, back of the book. And on the back of the book, there was a key to a Porsche in the book. It had been hidden there the entire time. And so the son in this case had become a slacker because of, because of an offense. And he, he said, well, there's, there's obviously nothing here. And he was not able to enjoy the, the, the gift that the father, the, 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 his, his, his real father had given him in that place. But in that place of recognizing wisdom and recognizing that, that there is a place of always learning, then we begin to learn how to, to know what the father is telling us. And we become wealthy as a result of that. Verse five, know the importance of the season you're in and a wise son you will be. But what a waste when an incompetent son sleeps through his day of opportunity. Now, I love this because let me, I did want to read from the Michelet here because it says the wise son gleans in summer, but a shameful son slumbers through the harvest. And, and both of these are talking about the place of, of work that needs to be done, right? We know that in the place of what Father has called us to be, there's, it's not that he's calling us to do something. We are not bound by uh, a set of laws. They're, the laws that, 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 that were established through the people of Israel, through the blood of Yeshua, the Christ, those laws have been have been completely dealt with, if you will. The Lord Himself said that I have fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law, and and uh, so in that place the, that we are no longer held by the law of sin and death, but through the law of the life in Christ Jesus, and that's the law that we're we're bound by. But yet at the same breath, there's a place of learning and understanding, and there's wisdom hidden inside of the expressions of those, those things. And so it's because it's it's not about what we do, it's about who we are and who we are in him and who he is in us. All right, does that make sense? So let me establish that as the baseline here. It's about it's about our relationship and the fact that I love him and he loves me, and I my heart is to be like him. And then from that place. I have an opportunity to then see when Father presents a place of learning from me to be able to walk through that challenge, gain the wisdom that he has given, and be able to come out the other side much more wiser and, and much more knowledgeable about how his word is working in my life. In other words, I don't want to stick with just... I want to learn everything that I can I can about my father. I want to become so like him that my heart, when I look at wisdom, 
I don't want to just look at wisdom. I mentioned this earlier. I don't want to look at wisdom to just gain wisdom because that's not wisdom. That's knowledge. I want to gain wisdom. I want to, to know the wisdom of the Father because I want to make it so much a part of me, so much inside of my heart that it becomes second nature. It's, it's, it's not even a thought. It's because I just know the, the process. I know the heart of the Father. I know my Father so well that he doesn't even have to open his mouth. I know because of the, of the very heartbeat of father, exactly what it is that he's thinking. Come on, the same thing's true with husbands and wives. Many times we can tell from our spouses uh, and even from our children, before they even open their mouth, we know what's, what's, what's in their heart, you know? And that's one of the things with, with my, um, not only my wife and I, but also with my, myself and my daughter, because I, all I had to do was just look into her eyes and usually that was enough because I could tell by the spirit that that place, because there was wisdom there. There was a wisdom that, that, that the father was teaching me and, 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 and how that I could, I could address my daughter and know those things of, of being able to deal with something. And so the same thing is true with him. When he looks into my eyes and I look into his eyes, that place of the wisdom uh, that, that he's looking at me and my heart breaks or my heart begins to to say, "Okay, Father, forgive me," or "Father, let me let me let me not count wisdom as little or nothing. Let me count it as being the great pearl, the pearl of great price that you've given from the very beginning." So, know the importance of the season you're in and a wise son you will be. In other words, when you're looking at the place between uh, the Mishlei talks about the difference between. Um, harvest and summer. Now, this might throw you off a little bit because you're like, wait a minute. Uh, I would, yeah, I, I might would see this a little bit different. Some people would think that the end of their life or their the older years would be that place of harvest, and that their younger were the younger years would be the place of the summer. But the truth is, metaphorically speaking, that's not the case. In this, in this proverb, what it's talking about is that the summer is talking about, excuse me, the harvest is talking about that place of youth. Why? Think about what's going on in harvest. The harvest means that someone needs to go out and to be able to glean in that harvest, to bring it in, to, to wrap the sheaves together, if you will. We're using wheat as our as our our, our, our plant here, our, as our uh, yeah, plant or our crop uh, here. And, and so, it, the young go out and are able to do that. They're able to 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 bring in the wheat and 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 if you will sheath it up and be able to have things set aside so that it can be the gleaned and brought in and then taken care of, be threshed. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done during the place of harvest. And so a young person is able to go out and do that with great, you know, well, I say with great ease. It's, you know, it's it's relative. Sometimes there's a lot of work to do and we come home tired. But the truth is, is that our youth brings us to that place where we can do those things. And that's a part of harvest. And so summer, during the summertime, that's when usually the harvest, for the most part, has been has been gleaned. There, but there are still harvests that's left out there. And so there's a time even in summer where you can not be lazy but still go out and be able to glean from that land. Just as, It's just not as hard of work as it is during the actual harvest itself. But again, this is talking from a metaphoric sense. Is it talking for real? Yes, but it's also talking metaphorically. And what it's talking about is that place of when we're young and when we're in the place where the father begins to teach us. So I want to be careful here because young is relative when it comes to the spirit realm. Okay, young is relative when it comes to the spirit. I could look back and I could look back with, with actually condemnation as to why I didn't spend more time with father when I was in my youth. And, and I could take this Proverbs and it could actually cause condemnation in my heart, but that is not what father is trying to portray here. Okay. It does talk about that place is as we begin to understand and we begin to mature, we begin to see the wealth of his word. We begin to see the wealth of understanding. And no, now don't get me wrong. I, I, I'm, I've really kind of, of 
battled this in my head for quite some time. Because there's, there's a place where I know that Yeshua has already paid the price. Yeshua has already done all that needs to be done. And that we are able to, in that place of grace, in the, in the, in the era of grace, in that place where he has given and given us uh, his unmerited, not only just unmerited favor, but, but hen, or that place of his promises to a son. And we know those promises are yet yes and amen. So grace is, is more than just unmerited favor. It's the promises that he made to us, to his sons. That's what hen, het, the, the, the letter of covenant, the letter of promise, and nun, a nun so feet specifically here, is the is the letter of, of being a son. And nun so feet, even more specifically, speaks about that son who is the who has become the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. And how do we become the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ? We become that fullness through his blood and through what he has done on the cross for us. In other words, that is already taken care of. We are already standing in the place of the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ, period. And yet, <laughs> we're still walking through it at the same time. Both are true. It's not an either or. Both are true. And so if that's the case, then with all of my heart, with all of my mind, with all of my soul, with all of my strength, Father, I want to learn and know more about you. And your word is a place where you have given me the opportunity to be able to dig and to find things. Matter of fact, you have hidden treasures inside of your word through not only just your word itself, but also through the living letters and through the, the patterns and through the, 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 the hidden things that you placed inside. And you allowed us to learn and to grow from, from that place. And you're given us an opportunity to do exactly what your scripture says. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to search it out. So you've given us a field that we can search out the, the, the depths of your secret. And so that's what I'm talking about here from the point, even in the youth in my spirit, that that father is saying now, OK, I want you to uh, I want you to, to spend some time. Go out. This this is the harvest time. Harvest out the, the understanding of my word because I want you to grow. I want you to be wise. I've given you wise discipline and I want you to be in this place where you're you're reflecting me in the earth. And wisdom brings about that place of the reflection of him in the earth through us. Because to me, it's in this word and through the ongoing word. It's both are true. Once again, not only through the, the written word, but also the ongoing word. He gives me his word and it changes me. It helps me to re remove the veils of my flesh. Those veils that I placed up that have hidden the, the promises of God or have tucked away a part of me that I didn't want God to see. And it rips them wide open and it allows the pure light of the Father to shine through me. It is his glory, but is his glory shining through me? That's the truth. That's the pure revelation of the Shekinah, the Shekinah, as we say in the, in the U.S., the Shekinah. The beauty of the glory of the Lord through us. You do realize that the Shekinah is us that he's talking about. It's the, it's, if you will, the glory of his bride. Let me keep going because I want to be honorable of the time. And I know we're getting getting kind of late here. Know the importance of the season you're in and a wise son you will be, but what a waste when an incompetent son sleeps through the day of his opportunity. And that goes without saying. That right there goes without saying. The lover of God is enriched beyond belief, but the evil man only curses his luck. Let's read that one in the Mishlei. Blessings will descend upon the head of the righteous one, but their violence will smother the mouth of the wicked. Now, that was the one that I was telling you guys about earlier, where I said, that's that's going to kind of surprise you a little bit when, when I talk about this. Because when we, especially when we talk about discipline and how the father disciplines his sons, that, that, that I know that the way that I used to see this is not the way that I see this now. I used to see God as the one who had the big bat up there. And, and every time I, I did something wrong, he was going to pop me and I was going to be spanked as a result of that. And I know, I know that I know that I know that that is no longer true. My God is a good God. My father is a good, good father. 
And as a matter of fact, come to think of it, we're coming up on Father's Day on, on this, this Sunday. Just, just hit me about that. And so there's, there's, he is a good, good father, and he's, he's given us the opportunity. And so it'd be like giving, giving a child all that they need, giving them a million dollars right in front of their face, and then saying, okay, what are you going to do with it? Now, some, as a child, as a youth, they would, they would squander it away and buy all kinds of things that they really don't need, and then there would be nothing left. But a wise son would look at that and do something, do something with it. And, uh, but if I go back to that first part of that, because if, if, I, if, if I was the one who had received a million dollars as a, as a 15-year-old, then I'd have spent it on Xboxes or video games or whatever else that, that, I, that I wanted to. And when I was done, there, the million dollars would be gone and there would be, there would be nothing left. And so my own choices brought about the fact that now at the end of that, because I squandered it all away, I'm going to have to deal with the poverty of it. My choice brought about the discipline that was necessary. In other words, that's exactly what this is talking about here. Blessings will descend upon the head of a righteous one. The one who walks in the ways of the Father, the one who walks in the place of love. But their violence, talking about the wicked one, not the righteous one, the, 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 the wickedness, the violence of the wickedness will smother the wealth, a mouth of the wicked. In other words, their choices will be the very thing that covers their mouth and keeps them from being able to speak. Not because Father did anything, but because their choices. Their choices to take care of themselves brought a, uh, the, the, the place of the, the downfall. Remember back when we were talking earlier in Proverbs and we talked about how the, the wicked will, will create or dig a hole in darkness? They can't see. All they know is that they're in, they're in a place where they're in a piece of land, but they can't see the place of land because there's complete darkness of where they are. They're wicked. They don't see the light of the Father. And they begin to dig a hole because they believe that as the righteous pass by them, that there's an opportunity for the righteous to fall into, and that wicked one could steal from the righteous one as he falls into the pit that he's just created. But what does Proverbs, what does Solomon go on to say here? He said, the very pit that was dug by the wicked man will be the very pit that they themselves will fall into. And that's exactly what he's talking about right here. So the wicked one, the wicked person, the violence of their wickedness will be what shuts their own mouth. Verse seven, the reputation of the righteous becomes a sweet memorial to him, while the wicked life only leaves a rotten stench. Remembrance of a righteous one, back in the Mishlei again, brings blessed, but the name of the wicked will rot. Now, I love this because the Mishlei begins to, to, to open up another aspect of this, and, and it's one that, that I'm still kind of mulling over even in my own, in my own heart. And, and not that I have to do it as a, as a way of, because that's the Hebrew way of doing that. I'm not trying to, to convert to Judaism. You guys know that. We've talked about this before. My, my heart is not, I'm, I'm a son, first and foremost. I, 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 truth be told, I don't even like Christianity either. I don't, both, both of the, the religious aspects of those are, are not a place where I want to connect myself with. I want to connect myself with Father. I'm a son first and foremost, nothing else. And so, but in this, the, the, the Lord began to open up something in me that I'm, I'm still, like, I'm, I'm just, just being truthful with you. I'm still mulling over in this place. And what it talks about is he says that remembrance of a righteous one brings blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. And the, the Mishlei begins to bring back the place of when Yahweh himself was speaking to Avraham, Abraham. And as he began to, to talk to him, he, he began to, to say, help me out here, Lord. Let me see if I can read it directly out of the book, out of the Mishlei. Oh, 
Oh, here it is. It's down at the footnotes. If you've got the Mishle yourself, it's down at the footnotes on page uh, 177. It's number two. And it says, the, sa the sages teach anyone who blesses others is blessed himself. For God will bless him in return. As God told Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. So, too, when the, 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 the priests blessed the Jews, God blessed them as they spoke the blessing over the Jews. When he's talking about that, there is the, uh, uh, the ironic blessing that we do at the end of every one of our classes, where I speak the, um, the, uh, the ironic blessing there. And because as they as they bless the Jewish people, as they bless those that are with them, then they the, they themselves will be blessed. And and I know that some of you may see some Hebrew stuff, and 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 in that they you hear you hear this statement when especially when they talk talk about Adonai, and they'll they'll make the statement Adonai blessed be He, blessed blessed be the Father in that place. And and it goes back to these scriptures, not only in Proverbs, but when when uh, when God spoke to Abraham and how He addressed Abraham and then blessed him right after that. And uh, and so there's it's it's a it's a beautiful do, do do we have to use the words blessed to be He? No, I think it's better sometimes to to show our blessings rather than it is to to just speak the blessing. But yet in the same time, sometimes it takes that place of, of, of repetition of the understanding of that, and, and, and it begins to allow it to get it deeper inside of our spirit, because we recognize that when we speak to someone, especially a righteous one, then we're, we, 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 we're speaking blessings along with that. And uh, now the same thing goes also true on the, on the cursing side of that, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Um. But the name of the wicked will rot, because once the wicked have done the things, the wickedness that they've done, then I sure as heck don't want to remember the wicked one. Their names over over uh, over eternity will diminish into into nothingness. I remember I've got something that that my family used to have when uh, my grandmother used to have years ago, and I've got to put away right now, and I want to bring it back down and put it back up in my in my house. But it's a it's a poem that my my grandfather had made out of wood by hand. And it's beautiful, and it says this: uh, "Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last." And that's exactly what this is talking about. Only what's done for the Father will last for an eternity. Because why? We're 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 walking in that place of the righteous one, the righteous Son, and and not in the in the place of the wicked. All right, let's keep going. The heart of the wise will easily accept instruction, but those who do all the talking are too busy to listen and learn. <laughs> you know, I uh, I love this because the father really began to mess with me about uh, about this one in particular, and where where Brian Simmons Dr. Brian Simmons talks about the heart of the wise in the Mishle it talks about the wise heart and uh or in Hebrew that would be chacham lev chacham is is the is a wise person chokhmah would be wisdom itself and so you can see that it's a variation of that same word with the same root but chacham is speaking about that person of that that is wise and lev is the Hebrew word for heart. And it expresses of, of exactly what I was talking about earlier when I was talking about a wise, a wise, one who is wise of heart will not gain wisdom just to gain wisdom. Again, that's knowledge. That's the third time I've repeated it, but I've done it on purpose. Uh, but a wise of heart will gain wisdom so that it becomes so much a part of him. He, he meditates on it. He goes back over it. He, he looks at it from different perspectives until it becomes second nature within himself. And so then it becomes a part of who he is. That's the wise heart. And a wise heart will easily accept instruction. In other words, I don't have it all. We we and we we just we've discussed that before. The whole core and focus of the diamond of Yahweh is just that. It's that each of us, you remember that wisdom is echad, wisdom is one, wisdom is like the, the river 
excuse me, the, the, the lake in the mountains that has streams that come down from that. Each one of us are at the, at the bottom of those streams receiving out of the wisdom of God through that river of understanding. But as we come back together and we take the different perspectives of what the Father shows up, us, and we talk to one another as we begin to engage with one another, then there's an opportunity where that wisdom comes back together as one again. But it comes in the place of the honor of, of, the, of, of where it was received. Remember that in, in the diamond of Yahweh, each of us are on the same level. There's no one above. There's no one below. There is a, each one of us are equal. We're kings amongst kings. We're priests amongst priests. And we're sons amongst sons, period. There's no, there's no, no levels, nothing like that in that place. And so in that place, then I can honor the wisdom of what Father's given you and, and it may be something that I don't see because I've not had to deal with this, or I may be walking into an error with, with a pure heart, but because of the wisdom that Father has given you, and you will let me know about what that wisdom is, I can find an error in the path that I was taking, even though I was pure in heart as I was moving towards that path. Are you following me? And that's exactly what this is talking about. It's talking about the heart of the wise will easily accept instru uh, instruction. It will be one who wants to learn. Because we recognize that each one of us are important. But those who do all the talking are too busy to listen and learn. It goes without saying, doesn't it? If all you're doing is constantly talking, then, then there's a place where uh, you're not really listening to anybody. You don't want to listen to instruction. Matter of fact, I've I've been in situations where I've tried to respond to to something, and the person would begin to talk over me, and and completely go down a whole other path, and and avoid the very statement. That's why I talked about. Remember last week we talked about how uh, uh, not to not to uh, correct a scoffer, because correcting a scoffer, they even they may not they may not come back at you and hate. They may not come back at you and and cause pain back to you. But they're certainly not going to use it, and they may even hate you over time because you're 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 bringing correction to their own way of thinking of things, and they don't want to have to be responsible for the things that they're responsible for. Of course, a wicked man will will not only it, it also talks about not correcting a wicked man because in the place of the wicked, they're going to take that 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 very thing that you've given them and they're going to slap it back at you and say. Mm -mm. You know, matter of fact, I'm going to try to harm you because you're trying to to do what you're doing, and so they they they're they're out for they're out for blood when the when it comes for the wicked. So in this place, it's talking about how, as a wise one, as one who is a chacham lev, wise of heart, we easily extract. Uh, but if we do a lot of talking and we don't let somebody talk to us, we don't hear what they have to say. Yeah, you know. I'm thinking of Balaam's donkey, and but I'm also thinking about a, a very real life um, situation where I was talking with somebody and they were they were angry about something, and the things that they were saying were harsh and not correct. But in the midst of what they were saying, they said something that did strike my heart, that was like, oh, wait a minute. Even though I don't like the way you're coming at me, even, even though you're saying a lot of things that are just junk, that was wisdom. And a wise one will hear that wisdom in what appears to be a bunch of junk. Are we willing to count even those things that come at us that, that don't seem right or, or, or come in anger or anything like that? Can we find the wisdom in that? Because a wise one will. Wise one will, just like Balaam's donkey, who when when Balaam was was taking the whip out and getting ready to beat the ever living tar out of that donkey, and the Lord opened his mouth and he said, "Dude, look, there's a freaking angel right in front of me that's got a sword drawn, about ready to chop your head off." You know, I don't. That's not exactly what it said in scripture. That's my modern day rendition of that, but you get the idea behind it. He begins to to show him what's there, and the donkey had to open his mouth. Well. I won't use the King James version of that, but you know we can we can use the modern vernacular of the King James for a donkey, and uh, and 
apply it to a plethora of things in our own lives. Anyway, I'll leave that one alone. That's why I love. That's why I love the fact that the uh, the 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 Ark of the Covenant was made with acacia wood or shatim wood, because we got to deal with our own shatim, right? And I I love that because it's it's it, it's it's maybe a little bit edgy, but I don't care. It's we do got to deal with our own shatim. Uh, they'll just keep stumbling ahead into the mess that they created. That's the rest of verse eight there. The, 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 the wise of heart will easily accept instruction, but those who do all the talking are too busy to listen and learn. They'll just keep stumbling ahead into the mess that they created. Hmm. Verse nine, the one who walks in integrity will experience a, a fearless confidence in life, but the one who is devious will eventually be exposed. The one who walks in integrity will experience a fearless confidence in life. Now, it's funny because this, this to me is where the spirit of the Lord begins to speak a lot because it's, it's in, in the place of integrity. There's a place of, of integrity inside of us that, 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 that kind of goes beyond just that place of a truth or a lie. Integrity goes far beyond that because it's not not always. Now, of course, a lie that we tell to someone else is damaging, but the lie to we tell that we tell ourselves is even far more damaging because we believe our own lie. And I want to talk about both sides of that in the place of with others and with ourselves, because if I walk in integrity in myself, there will be a fearless confidence. In my life, that place that I know that, that that if there's any one thing that the Lord has called and been teaching me about over the last several months, especially, is that place of standing in the fullness of confidence in him, that fearless confidence in him, that even in situations I can stand up and say uh, no, or I can stand up and say yes, or whatever it is that the Lord is called, and I can have a confidence in knowing whether it's a popular decision or not. I can stand up with the confidence in knowing that I've done exactly what the Father had told me to do. And I can stand in that confidence in knowing that he will take care of all of my needs according to his riches and glory, period. But if I'm going to be devious about it, if I'm going to go around and hide things and, and keep things hidden and, and, and so on, then that's going to eventually be exposed because we can't keep up with the lies. We can't keep up with the lies at all. Verse 10, I'm going to wrap it up with this. The, the troublemaker always has a clever plan and won't look you in the eye, but the one who speaks correction honestly can be trusted to make peace. That's funny because I know for me, one of the, one of the things that I look for when I talk to people is, are you willing to look me in the eye? Are you willing to take the time to, to, to look at me face to face? You know, we've, we, we know that the eyes are the windows to the soul. And many times we can see the heart and expression of somebody through their eyes. Now, can we can we see it without looking into their eyes? Sure. We do know that the the place of our heart has a field that wraps out at least five to six feet around us. And so there's a there's a place where people can you know, that we we can detect in each other those times when things are 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 somebody's having a difficulty because they come by and we can we can hear the dissonance in their frequency of, of what at least the, those are the modern terms for that. Sometimes the way we used to see it is, well, I can tell something's up with you. Are you okay? That's what we used to say, right? I can tell something's just not right, or, or you know, you're you're not acting your usual. There's something different in the way that you're portraying yourself. There's something different in your countenance. And 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 so these modern terms bring out an even greater depth of that. And uh, but someone who's unwilling to look you in the eye is someone who's more than likely trying to hide something. It's trying to, to not connect with you because there's then there's that place of suddenly uh, the Holy Spirit begins to, 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 to hit their heart because the purity of your heart, it hits their heart and suddenly they're, they're like, 
they, they feel convicted, not because, not because of you per se, but it is because of you, because you made the choice to be a righteous son. You made the choice to be the one who walks in integrity. And the Lord is, and the Father is, is shining his light of his love and his compassion and his integrity through you. And when it hits the eyes of the wicked man, it's like a, 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 a blind man in darkness who suddenly sees a light, right? Suddenly they're like, oh, I can't, I can't handle that. It's too bright. And that's exactly what this is talking about. The troublemaker always has this clever plan and won't look you in the eye because he's trying to deceive you. But one who speaks correction honestly, one who speaks. Now, see, correction here doesn't always necessarily mean just the place of, of the correction in a, in a place of discipline. There is a place where in conversation, in a sense, we, we do discipline one another, but not in the, the strict sense of the term of like a, like a father or mother or a parent or something like that. What do I mean by that? It's, it's a, can it come through that way? Absolutely. Can it come through one who is in, in authority over us? Absolutely. But can it also come from one another? Absolutely. In other words, you don't even have to be trying to correct me, <laughs> but something you say stirs something inside of my heart. And in that place, Holy Spirit takes what you have said and it becomes a correction to me. It becomes a way that I've, I see things now from a different perspective because the understanding that the Father has given you, and I recognize that it's, it's, it's from the wisdom of God, and I say, I need to apply that. And so the truth is, is that, that in the place where, where there's an honesty amongst all of this, then there can be a trust in the place of, of peace. Now, I love this word peace because in Hebrew, we know it's shalom. But please don't think of shalom as just being just peace. It is far more than just peace. It's relationship. It's friendship. It's connection. It's the depth of the heart of the Father in learning of the wisdom as we begin to to hear the understanding, if you will. The way I used to see it is was puzzle pieces. God gave me a puzzle piece and he gave you a puzzle piece. This whole puzzle is the, is the picture of wisdom and the fullness of, of wisdom as being one in Father. But he gives each of us a puzzle piece. But as I, we connect the puzzle pieces together, now I begin to see a bigger picture of what Father is doing. And as a result, there's a place where now I can honor you in the place of shalom, in the place of learning, in the place of the peace. And, and it helps me to become the, the man of God that he had meant me to be. He comes, it helps you to become the, 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 the man of God, the woman of God that he's made you to be as well. So, Father, I thank you for these first 10. And I thank you for these, these, this first chapter of, of, of the Proverbs of Solomon. Father, Proverbs chapter 10. As we begin to break down the, the 30 some odd verses that are in here, um, I know that we're going to be going over probably 10 verses over the next couple of weeks and, and break it down on a very slow pace because I want to go slowly through this. This is the part that I knew that, uh, that we were going to take our time through a good bit. And so, Father, I want to thank you that you teach us in every single one of these, these places, and that even though it seems unrelated, just like in these first 10 verses, Father, you begin to see this place where you describe the difference between the witches, the, the wicked, the righteous, and the wicked, and, and that place of, of allowing us to not judge each other, but to judge ourselves as to where we sit in that, in that place of that. Father, that, that, that our heart is to be a righteous son. And, and that, Father, that, that if there was something in there that has, has touched our heart, that, Father, it would, we were able to then use your wisdom to be able to understand how to overcome or how to take care of or how to deal with that issue that, that, uh, that, that you brought out through your wise discipline, through you, Musar, your Musar Haskell, and, and you taught us. Because, Father, our heart is not just to be wise, to be wise, because we know that is knowledge. But, Father, our heart is to be wise and become so wise that it becomes a part of who we are. And so in that place, it's second nature. It's just an automatic. Because we know your heart. 
We know your face. We know that place of, of how important you are to us, Father. And Father, how important we are to you. Never let us forget how important that we are to you as well. So, Father, thank you for today. Ivarechacha Adonai ve'ishmarecha. Ye'er Adonai panavalecha ve'chunecha. Ye'sa Adonai panavalecha ve'yesim lecha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. That word grace, the chen, the, the, the promises of a son, the promises to a son, that place where we know that we can stand and knowing that it is already done because of your promises that you've already given us, the promises of a righteous son, that, that your face will be gracious to us. Father, that you will turn your face towards us and give us peace. Blessings and shalom to all of you uh, that have been here today.